These twelve selections are only a small sampling of classical ballets worldwide. There are so many more, all with their own adventure and entertaining story to tell. Over the years, many directors and producers of these ballets have used artistic license to modify and make changes to story and choreography. The Nutcracker appears to be the winner in this category with a wide spectrum of storyline and choreographic adaptations. The following are only one interpretation. They include some basics about the origins of each ballet. Cinderella is scrubbing down the kitchen floor and daydreaming about how happy she was when her mother was alive. Her daydreams quickly fade when her mean stepsisters demand her to make them breakfast. An old beggar woman comes to the door and asks Cinderella for some food. She is about to give her some. The evil stepmother forbids her to do it. She decides to give the old woman her own food, and Cinderella is left without eating a thing. After breakfast, Cinderella returns to her chores. Her stepsisters receive a letter from the palace, an invitation to the royal ball for the prince of the kingdom. Cinderella's stepmother and stepsisters go into town to buy gowns and accessories for the ball. Cinderella is left alone. Cinderella is consoled by her mice friends. The mice cheer her up by making her a dress out of rags. After Cinderella puts on her gown, the old woman appears once more. She magically transforms into a fairy godmother and turns Cinderella's rag gown into a beautiful dress fit for a princess. She turns a pumpkin into a royal carriage and turns the mice into horses. She tells Cinderella to go to the ball, but to be back before midnight. Before Cinderella leaves, the fairy godmother gives Cinderella a pair of glass slippers. At the royal ball, while the stepsisters try to get the prince's attention, Cinderella steps foot into the ballroom. The prince is captivated by her beauty, as is every other gentleman. Nobody knows who the mysterious girl is, not even Cinderella's stepfamily. Cinderella and the prince dance the night away, causing Cinderella to forget about her midnight deadline. As the clock starts to chime, she realizes she must go before her clothes turn into rags. She quickly leaves without explanation and in her hurry leaves a glass slipper behind on the stairs. The prince chases after her but only finds the single glass slipper. The next day, the prince, unable to stop thinking about Cinderella, orders a kingdom-wide search to find her. He travels from house to house with the glass slipper and has each girl try it on. If the slipper fits, it must be the mysterious girl he danced with the night before. When the prince arrives at Cinderella's house, he is greeted by the obnoxious stepsisters. The stepsisters try on the slipper, but it does not fit. During this time, Cinderella's stepmother has locked her in a room so she could not try on the slipper. Since the glass slipper did not fit either of the stepsisters' feet, Cinderella's stepmother insists to try it on. She manages to force her foot into the slipper. True to his word, the prince proposes to Cinderella's stepmother. 
Cinderella finds out from her mice friends and starts to shout in her cell, alerting the prince that there is still one more girl left in the house. Once Cinderella is freed from her cell, she tries on the slipper. It is a perfect fit. A royal wedding takes place at the palace, and Cinderella and the prince live happily ever after. Prokofiev's score for Cinderella is one of his most popular and melodious compositions. The stepsisters and stepmothers are traditionally travesty roles, which means that the female roles are usually played by men. Don Quixote As the ballet begins, an aging nobleman named Don Quixote becomes obsessed with stories of ancient rivalry. Appearing a little silly, he uses his imagination and pretends to be a brave knight. He imagines that he sets out to rescue the lady of his dreams named Dulcinea. He transforms his servant, Sancho Panza, into a trusty squire, and off they go. Don Quixote leads a charge against imaginary enemies, which he sees everywhere. He proceeds to fight invisible rivals, puppets, and windmills. Don Quixote is a ballet in three acts, based on episodes taken from the famous novel Don Quixote de la Mancha by Miguel de Cervantes. It was originally choreographed by Marius Pepita to the music of Ludwig Minkus and first presented by Moscow's Bolshoi Ballet on December 26, 1869. The role of Don Quixote, the title character in the ballet, is usually portrayed by an older dancer. Even nowadays, the characters of Don Quixote and Sancho Panza are not heavily involved in the storyline. The Nutcracker Clara's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Silberhouse, were having a party on Christmas Eve. Clara and her friends were eagerly awaiting for her uncle Drosselmeyer to arrive and hand out his gifts. He was a toy maker and generally mysterious gentleman. The children loved him. He always made entertaining gifts. When he arrived, Drosselmeyer presented life-sized dancing dolls to entertain everyone. He gave Clara a wooden nutcracker in the shape of a military soldier. Then he gave Fritz, Clara's little brother, a stuffed mouse. Fritz wanted the nutcracker too, and it broke as he tried to take it away. Later that night, after the party was over and everyone had gone home, Clara came back downstairs to look for her new toy. She found it, but was tired and laid down on the sofa and fell asleep. She woke up to find a battle in her room. The Nutcracker and Mouse Queen had a sword fight, and it looked like the mice were going to win. Clara distracted the Mouse Queen. She turned, and the Nutcracker was victorious. The Nutcracker turned into a handsome prince. He was very thankful, so he invited her to visit his home, the Land of the Sweets. To assist her in this journey, Clara's home was transformed by the magic of the dream fairy. She stepped into her dream world and into a flurry of snowflakes. Clara arrived to the land of sweets. The prince told everyone about the adventure and how they came to arrive at their doorstep. All the people of the kingdom were thankful to have their nutcracker prince returned to them. She realized that it was all a dream, or was it? 
the history of the Nutcracker Ballet, because Marius Pepita choreographed Sleeping Beauty and much of Swan Lake during the same period, many thought he was also responsible for the Nutcracker. The fact is that Lev Ivanov, his assistant, should take primary credit for the ballet. There was a new musical instrument, the Celesta, developed in Paris by Auguste Mustel, that was used for the first time in any kind of production. Tchaikovsky, who composed the music for the Nutcracker, loved the instrument so much that he had one secretly shipped from Paris to Moscow. The Celesta is used primarily for the music in the Sugar Plum Fairy Dance. The ballet was first performed in 1892 at the Mariinsky Theater in St. Petersburg, sharing the bill with the new opera, Eilanth. Neither were very well received. Perhaps the Russians of that time did not welcome a German story, or it could have been that real children were used in a ballet. Using children in any kind of ballet was unheard of at that time. Ballet was for adults only, on stage or in the audience. The first complete performance of this story ballet in America was by the Ballet Russe de Monte Carlo at the 51st Street Theater in New York, October 17, 1940. George Balanchine performed it with the New York City Ballet on February 2, 1954, and with great success. Balanchine had his own roots in the Nutcracker. He danced the lead role at the Mariinsky Theater in 1919. Since that time, this story ballet has become a popular seasonal item, with hundreds of ballet companies and thousands of dance studios performing it worldwide. The Sleeping Beauty in a magical fairy kingdom, a princess named Aurora was born to the wonderful king and queen. The kingdom's fairy of protection, the Lilac Fairy, and all of her maidens were invited to celebrate Princess Aurora's birth. Due to the excitement of the moment, the royal family forgot to invite the uniquely unpleasant fairy, Carabos. Although Carabos is distraught by their forgetfulness, she and her posse come to the party anyway, but with evil intentions. She disguised herself as a beautiful fairy and pretended to enjoy the festivities. However, since she's evil, she casts a spell over Princess Aurora, saying that on her 16th birthday she will prick her finger and die. Quick to save the princess, the Lilac Fairy casts another spell, this one saying that she will only fall asleep after sustaining the injury to her digit. Sixteen years later, the royal family is celebrating Princess Aurora's 16th birthday. Since the night of her birth, the king had ordered that all sharp objects be kept out of the kingdom so she could not hurt herself. During the celebration, Carabos disguises herself again, this time as a beautiful seamstress, and presents Princess Aurora with a beautiful tapestry. Dazzled by its beauty, Princess Aurora grabs the tapestry and pricks her finger on a needle that Carabos secretly embedded. Carabos laughs in victory and runs out of the castle. Remembering the spell she had cast before, the Lilac Fairy appears to make sure Princess Aurora had only fallen asleep. The Lilac Fairy also casts a spell on the entire family and court to fall asleep, ensuring them of their safety. One hundred years later in a dark forest, a prince by the name of Florimund is hunting with his friends. He leaves his friends and insists on being alone. 
the lilac fairy hears the commotion and ventures out to Prince Florimund. He tells her that he is lonely and is in need of love. She has the perfect idea. She presents an image of Princess Aurora to him, and he instantly falls in love. The lilac fairy reveals the hidden castle to Prince Florimund. Just when Prince Florimund steps into the castle doorway, Carabos appears before him. She will not let him pass, but Prince Florimund overpowers her, and he races into the castle. Knowing the only way to break the spell, he quickly finds Princess Aurora and kisses her. The spell is broken, and Carabos is finally defeated. Princess Aurora and her entire family wake up from their deep sleep. Princess Aurora accepts Prince Florimund's proposal for marriage, and her family approves. The castle is filled with music and laughter as the family and maids clean the dusty old castle for the wedding. The wedding is attended by the prince's family as well as the fairies. And, like every great fairy tale, they seal their marriage with a kiss and live happily ever after. The Sleeping Beauty Ballet was adapted from the 1697 tale by Charles Perrault, The Sleeping Beauty in the Wood. Tchaikovsky wrote the music, and his longtime collaborator, Marius Pepita, choreographed the dances. It was first presented at the Mariinsky Theater in St. Petersburg, Russia, on January 15, 1890. The Sleeping Beauty was Tchaikovsky's longest ballet, including intermissions it clocked in at nearly four hours. Swan Lake On his 21st birthday, Prince Siegfried arrives at his royal party on the palace courtyards. All of the royal families and townspeople are dancing and celebrating, while the young ladies are anxiously seeking his attention. During the exquisite celebration, his mother gives him a crossbow and informs him that because he is of age now, his marriage will quickly be arranged. Hit with the sudden realization of his future responsibilities, he takes his crossbow and makes haste into the woods with his hunting buddies. Prince Siegfried finds himself a peaceful spot by an enchanted lake where swans gently float across its surface. While Siegfried watches, he spots the most beautiful swan with a crown on its head. His buddies soon catch up, but he orders them to leave so he can be by himself. As dusk falls, the swan with the crown turns into the most beautiful young woman he has ever seen. Her name is Odette, the Swan Queen. She informs the young prince that an evil sorcerer, von Rothbart, disguised himself as Prince Siegfried's mentor. Von Rothbart has turned her and the other girls into swans and that the lake was formed by the tears of their parents weeping. She tells him that the only way the spell could be broken is if a man, pure in heart, pledges his love to her. The prince, about to confess his love for her, is quickly interrupted by the evil sorcerer. He takes Odette from Prince Siegfried's embrace and commands all of the swan maidens to dance upon the lake and its shore so that the prince cannot chase them. Prince Siegfried is left all alone on the shore of Swan Lake. The next day, Prince Siegfried is presented with many prospective princesses. Although the princesses are worthy of his attention, he cannot stop thinking about Odette. 
His mother commands him to choose a bride, but he cannot. For the meantime, he at least dances with them. While the prince is dancing, trumpets announce the arrival of von Rothbart. He brings his daughter, Odile, on whom he has cast a spell to appear as Odette. The prince is captivated by her beauty as he dances with the impostor. Unbeknownst to Prince Siegfried, the true Odette is watching him from a window. The prince soon confesses his love to Odile, thinking that she is Odette. Odette is horrified and flees into the night. Prince Siegfried sees the real Odette fleeing and realizes his mistake. Upon his realization, von Rothbart reveals to the prince the true appearance of his daughter Odile. Prince Siegfried quickly leaves the party and chases after Odette. Odette has fled back to the lake and joined the rest of the girls in sadness. Prince Siegfried finds them gathered at the shore, consoling each other. He explains to Odette the trickery of von Rothbart, and she grants him her forgiveness. It isn't long before von Rothbart and Odile appear in their evil, unhuman, somewhat bird-like forms. Von Rothbart tells the prince that he must stick to his word and marry his daughter. Prince Siegfried tells von Rothbart that he would rather die with Odette than to marry Odile. He then takes Odette's hand and together they jump into the lake. The spell is broken and the remaining swans turn back into humans. They quickly drive von Rothbart and Odile into the water where they too drown. The girls watch the spirits of Prince Siegfried and Odette ascend into the heavens above Swan Lake. Swan Lake was first performed on March 4, 1877 and was initially regarded as a failure. Critics dismissed Tchaikovsky's music as too noisy. Dancers disliked the fast-paced score. It wasn't until after Tchaikovsky's death that French choreographer Marius Pepita revived the iconic ballet. The first performance was staged at the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow. Once more, it was not a success. Nothing in those days suggested it would one day become one of the best-known ballets. La Cifide. On the morning of his wedding day, a Scottish farmer named James falls in love with a vision of a beautiful sylph, a magical creature. An old witch appears before him, predicting that he will betray his fiancée. Although enchanted by the sylph, James disagrees, sending the witch away. All seems fine as the wedding begins, but as James begins to put the ring on his fiancée's finger, the sylph suddenly appears and snatches it away from him. James abandons his own wedding, running after her. He chases the sylph into the woods, where he again sees the old witch. She offers James a magical scarf. She tells him that the scarf will bind the sylph's wings, enabling him to catch her for himself. James is so enamored by the sylph that he wishes to catch her and keep her forever. James decides to take the magical scarf and wrap it around the sylph's shoulders. Unfortunately, when he does, the sylph's wings fall off and she dies. James is left all alone and heartbroken. Then he watches his fiancée marry his best friend. Like all too many classical ballet stories, this one also does not end with the happily ever after scenario. 
interesting facts about La Cifide. A sylph is a mythological creature or spirit. The ballet tells the story of an impossible love between a human and a spirit and man's inherent temptation for the unknown and sometimes dangerous life. La Cifide remains a captivating, fascinating ballet that appeals to both audiences and dancers. The ballet is presented in two acts, usually running about 90 minutes. La Cifide is one of the world's oldest existing romantic ballets. It originally premiered on March 12, 1832 in Paris, with now lost choreography by Filippo Taglioni. A success, the ballet was re-choreographed in 1836 by the Danish ballet master August Bernenville. La Cifide is not to be confused with Les Cifides. Les Cifides is considered to be the first storyless or abstract ballet. It was choreographed by Michael Fokine and premiered in 1909 in Paris with Diaghilev's Ballet Russe. Set to Chopin, the original cast included ballet stars of the time, Anna Pavlova and Václav Nijinsky. Giselle. As the ballet begins, a nobleman named Albrecht is busily wooing a young, beautiful peasant girl named Giselle. Albrecht leads the young maiden to believe that he is a farmer named Lois. Giselle falls in love with the man, unaware that he is already betrothed to Bathilde, daughter of the Duke. She agrees to marry the man, despite the romantic advancements of another peasant, Hilarion, who suspects that Albrecht is an impostor. Giselle wants badly to dance, but her mother warns her that she has a weak heart. A prince and his entourage are soon announced by the hunting horn. When the prince's daughter realizes that she and Giselle are both engaged, she gives her a gold necklace. Hilarion tells Giselle that Albrecht has been deceiving her, that he is actually a nobleman. Bathilde quickly reveals to Giselle that Albrecht is indeed her fiancé. Horrified and weak, Giselle goes mad and dies of a broken heart. The second act of the ballet takes place in a forest beside Giselle's grave. The queen of the ghostly willies, virgins who have died of unrequited love, calls upon them to accept Giselle as one of their own. When Hilarion stops by, the willies make him dance to his death. When Albrecht arrives, Giselle, now a willie herself, dances with him until the willie's power is lost when the clock strikes four. Realizing that Giselle has saved him, Albrecht cries at her grave. The willies in Giselle are ghostly spirits of dead girls jilted on their wedding day. They force men to dance to their deaths, which is likely the origination of the phrase, a real case of the willies. Some have traced the willy to a Slavic witch spirit associated with water. The name is a cognate of the Scandinavian Valkyrie of opera fame. The original Giselle in 1841 contained 54 minutes of mime and 60 minutes of dance, suggesting accomplished dancers also had to be skilled actors. Over the years, dance has taken a more significant role in telling the story. The name Giselle is derived from the Germanic word Gisil, meaning hostage or pledge. 
This name may have originally been a descriptive nickname for a child given as a pledge to a foreign court. In the 1800s, Giselle was advertised as a ballet fantastique, meaning the ballet involved a dark and powerful spiritual world and supernatural or fantastical elements. By contrast, Sleeping Beauty was considered a ballet fairy with its more benign fairies. La Bayadere La Bayadere takes place in the royal India of long ago. As the ballet begins, we learn that Nikia, a beautiful temple dancer, is in love with a young warrior named Solor. However, Solor is engaged to the Raja's daughter. During the betrothal, Nikia is forced to dance after which she receives a basket of flowers from the Raja's daughter. The basket contains a deadly snake that bites her and Nikia dies. Solor dreams of reuniting with Nikia in the Kingdom of the Shades. He then awakens remembering that he is still engaged. At his wedding, however, he sees a vision of Nikia he mistakenly says his vows to her instead of his bride-to-be. The gods become infuriated and destroy the palace. Solor and Nikia reunite in spirit in the Kingdom of the Shades. La Bayadere is most famous for its white act, commonly known as the Kingdom of the Shades. It is one of the most celebrated excerpts in all of classical ballet. The dance begins with 32 women in white, all making their way down a ramp in unison. The dance is exquisite and often performed by itself. La Bayadere was the creation of the dramatist Sergei Kutunov and of Marius Pepita the renowned premier maitre de ballet of the St. Petersburg Imperial Theatres. The music was composed by Ludwig Minkus, who from 1871 until 1886 held the official post of ballet composer to the St. Petersburg Imperial Theatres. Coppelia the ballet is about a life-size doll constructed by the eccentric local toy maker, Dr. Coppelius. The doll sits on its balcony all day, appearing to be reading a book and never speaking to anyone. A boy named Franz falls deeply in love with her and wants to marry her, even though he is already engaged to another. His fiancée, Swanhilda, sees Franz flirting and throwing kisses at the Coppelia doll. After they see the doctor leave his home for some evening festivities at the local pub, Swanhilda and her friends sneak into his home and workshop. They wish to confront this young lady who has stolen the heart of her betrothed Franz. Dr. Coppelius has a mission to breathe life into his creation. In an ancient book of legend, Dr. Coppelius has found a spell that he believes possesses magical powers and that it may bestow life upon his beloved doll. The spell requires the soul of another, so he finds Franz gets him drunk until he passes out, and then proceeds to extract the life essence of the young man. Meanwhile, in the doctor's workshop, Swanhilda soon learns that Coppelia is actually a doll that was made by, and belongs, to Dr. Coppelius. The doctor returns home, and Swanhilda and her friends scatter and hide. Swanhilda strips the wig and costume from the doll and puts it on, pretending to be the automaton. 
He recites the incantation to the doll, not knowing it is actually Swanhilda. She goes along with the story, seemingly coming to life, bringing glee to the doctor. Still in character as the doll, Swanhilda goes on a rampage in the workshop, knocking over and breaking whatever is in her path. Just as she pulls off the wig, Franz enters the workshop to confront the doctor about his deed. The poor doctor is dejected, and Franz, Swanhilda, and her friends leave him alone with his doll in the workshop. In the final scene, Swanhilda and Franz make up and get married. The marriage is celebrated with several festive dances. Coppelia is a classical ballet based on a story by E.T.A. Hoffman entitled Der Sandmann, which was published in 1815. The ballet was first performed in May of 1870 at the Théâtre Imperial L'Opera in Paris with a 16-year-old Giuseppina Bozacchi in the role of Swanhilda. It eventually became one of the most performed ballets at the opera. Dr. Coppelius has many similarities to Uncle Drosselmeyer in The Nutcracker. The Coppelia story evolved from traveling shows of the late 18th and early 19th centuries starring mechanical automatons. Paquita. The ballet takes place during Napoleon's occupation in Spain and tells the tale of Paquita, the heroine. Kidnapped as an infant when her noble parents were murdered, Paquita grew up as a Spanish gypsy during the occupation of Napoleon's troops. Although Paquita was abducted by the Romani people, she is actually of noble birth. After saving the life of French officer Lucien de Hervilly from an assassination attempt by the gypsy chief Inigo, she falls in love. Paquita was created by the French ballet master Joseph Mazillier for the Paris Opera Ballet. It was first performed on April 1, 1846, starring Carlotta Grisi and Lucien Pepita. The ballet was so successful that it went on to debut two months later at the Drury Lane Theatre in London. From there, Marius Pepita brought the piece to the Imperial Ballet of St. Petersburg, Russia in 1847. It should be noted that this was the first ever work that Marius Pepita staged in Russia. Pepita revived Paquita in 1904 and added a third act, the Grand Pas Classique, a delightful wedding celebration with new music and choreography to add vibrance to the ballet. Romeo and Juliet the ballet begins with feuding between the Capulets and the Montagues. Wearing a mask, Romeo Montague crashes a party at the house of Capulet where he meets Juliet Capulet. It is love at first sight. The two secretly proclaim their eternal love for each other on the balcony. Hoping to finally put an end to the family feud, Friar Lawrence secretly marries the couple. But the feuding continues when Juliet's cousin Tybalt kills Romeo's friend Mercutio during a fight. In an act of revenge, a distraught Romeo kills Tybalt and is thus sent to exile. Juliet turns to Friar Lawrence for help, so he devises a plan to help her. Juliet is to drink a sleeping potion to make her appear dead. Her family will then bury her. 
Friar Lawrence will then tell Romeo the truth. He will rescue her from her tomb and take her away, where they will live together happily ever after. That night, Juliet drinks the potion. When her distraught family finds her dead the next morning, they proceed to bury her. The news of Juliet's death reaches Romeo, and he returns home desperately grieving because he had lost her. Unfortunately, he never received the message from Friar Lawrence. Believing that Juliet is really dead, he drinks a poison. When Juliet awakens, she sees that Romeo is dead and stabs herself. Using the music of Luigi Mariscalci and the choreography by Eusebio Luzzi, this five-act ballet was performed at the Teatro Samuele in Venice, Italy. Esmeralda The beautiful gypsy girl Esmeralda, under gypsy law, marries the poet Pierre Gringoire to save him from execution in the hands of the gypsy king. The groom is in love, but Esmeralda makes it clear that the marriage is strictly one of convenience. However, there is another who desires Esmeralda, the corrupt archdeacon Claude Frollo, who is torn between his duty to God and his desire for Esmeralda. Frollo orders his henchman Quasimoto to capture Esmeralda, but she is rescued by the handsome Captain Phoebus de Chateaupierre. She falls in love with him, unaware that he is engaged to the beautiful Fleur de Lis. Rather than have her attacker arrested, Esmeralda shows Quasimoto mercy and gives him some water, earning his affections. Phoebus gives Esmeralda his fiancé's scarf, but when Fleur de Lis discovers this, she angrily calls off the engagement, leaving Phoebus free to be with Esmeralda. However, the jealous Frollo attempts to exact revenge by stabbing Phoebus, believing he has killed him and frames Esmeralda for the crime. Esmeralda is found guilty of murder and sentenced to death by hanging. On the day of the Feast of Fools, she is led to the gallows as Frollo watches in triumph. However, his plan is thwarted when Phoebus arrives alive and well, having survived the stabbing, and clears Esmeralda's name. Esmeralda was created by Jules Perrault and César Pugni for the ballet of Her Majesty's Theatre in London, and is based on the novel Notre Dame de Paris, also known as The Hunchback of Notre Dame, by Victor Hugo. After its successful publication in 1831, Hugo's novel was first adapted to the stage in an opera by French composer Louis Bertin in 1836 under the title La Esmeralda. The novel was first adapted into a ballet at La Scala Milan by Antonio Montecini in 1839. It was first presented by the Ballet of Her Majesty's Theatre in London on March 9th, 1844. Montecini's version differed greatly from Perrault's, primarily due to a common tradition in Italian ballets at the time. The functions of mime and dance were separated. The principal roles were played by mimes, while Fanny Cerrito, who was the prima ballerina of La Scala at the time, only appeared in the dances.
you can help us get the word out. Give us a like, subscribe, follow, and share.